Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Andrea with St. Mark's Hospital. Our speaker today is Carly Cervantes with the trauma program at St. Mark's Hospital. I'll let her tell you a little bit about herself as she gets started. <clears throat> if you have questions during the course of this presentation, please put them in the chat. If they are on topic, we will get them taken care of in the moment. If they are um, off topic, we can address them at the end as well. So Carly, go ahead, it's all you. Awesome, thank you. Um, and if you'll just let me know if there are questions in the chat, um, I'm not sure if the chat will pop up for me or not. So feel free to interrupt yeah. me, Andrea, if needed, and um, so I can answer as we go. I will, I'll keep an eye on it. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm Carly Cervantes. I am the trauma program director at St. Mark's Hospital. I've been here for about five years now. Um, I am an ER nurse by trade. Um, I've worked at uh, the University of Utah in their level one emergency center, um, as well as here at St. Mark's Hospital. Um, I have a master's in public health and, uh, and I do have my bachelor's in the science of nursing as well. Um, and just, just as a little preface to my life, um, I'm a big uh, outdoor traveler, camper, um, like to go boating, lots of that kind of stuff. So um, doing injury prevention activities um, and just doing really small tweaks and how you enjoy uh, whatever activity you're doing is really important to me. So um, I'm just excited to kind of share some of the tips and tricks and um, things that the literature is supporting with you all. Um, just really quick, I have nothing to disclose. I have no financial ties to anything. So I am going to be talking about some products and websites and uh, things like that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't get paid to talk to you about them. Uh, maybe one day I will, but now I don't. Um, so really anything that I'm recommending or, or giving advice on is just things that I have used and that I like. Um, I'm not getting sponsored to tell you any of these things. So. So we're going to talk a little bit about summer safety for uh, just general travel, um, water safety, uh, how to stay safe in the heat and sun, and any like bug and animal encounters, uh, that kind of stuff. So we'll start with travel. Um, this data I got from zerofatalities.com. If if you guys have not uh, visited this website, please do. There's so many great tips and and statistics and um, resources out there, especially if you have young drivers in your home. Um, this is very up to date, uh, great information. So, um, one of my biggest, or two of my biggest plugs today are going to be, uh, don't drink and drive, uh, don't use alcohol while you're recreating for most activities, um, and wear your seatbelt. Um, those are the two biggest things that, that I can tell you. Um, so top left on this slide here, um, alcohol impaired driver crashes are four times more likely to be fatal than other crashes. So um, again, it's just alcohol, it complicates everything and, and it really decreases your reaction time. Somebody dies every 51 minutes from a drunk driving crash in the, in the United States. So in the course of this meeting, somebody is going to die from uh, alcohol induced crash. Uh, and that's a really heartbreaking statistic. Um, down on the bottom there, when the driver is unbuckled, 76% of children also ride unbuckled. When the driver is buckled, 87% of children will also buckle up in the car. So for those of you who do have children or any passengers, your behavior directly influences the behavior of those in your vehicle. So as the driver, make sure that you're buckling up because it will, it will save lives. Um, this was an interesting statistic down there in the in the bottom middle. Um, so in a crash, unbuckled passengers can become a projectile and increase the risk of hurting or killing others in the car by 40%. I think that a lot of people, uh, when you're talking about buckling up, they kind of think about their own safety. And, you know, I've heard a lot of people in the past say, you know, living on the edge, I don't really care, you know, it's me. Um, I, you know, I'm watching out for myself, but if you have passengers in the car, people don't realize that your body becomes a projectile. So buckle up for the people in your car. Um, if that's, if that's the excuse that I can give you, um, it's please, you know, when you have passengers, uh, make sure you're buckling up. Over the last 5 years, almost half of all people who died on Utah's roads were not buckled. So it's a simple, easy thing. Please wear your seatbelt, please. 
Uh, questions that we get all the time are about uh, car seats, boosters, ages, you know, all of those things. So on the top right there, the tips with kids. So children that are less than 13 should always sit in the back seat, um, regardless of whether or not they're in a car seat or booster. Anybody less than 13 should be in the back seat always. Children that are less than two and less than 30 pounds should be in a rear facing car seat or longer if the manufacturer of the car seat uh, says that that you can be in for, for uh, longer. Children that are less than four and less than 40 pounds should ride in a forward facing car seat. So if they're between 30 and 40 pounds, um, they can ride in a forward facing car seat. Children that are greater than four years old and greater than 40 pounds can ride in a booster seat. Both of those criteria have to be met. The child has to be four and 40 pounds to ride in a booster seat. The booster seat should be used until the child is four foot nine inches tall. Um, that's usually about eight years old, um, give or take some, but generally speaking, they don't go with age, they go with height. So until they're four foot nine. Um, and one thing that a lot of people forget is that car seats and boosters expire. Um, the plastic that they're created with doesn't last forever. Um, and can get worn down over time. So it's not as effective in a crash. So you'll see they're usually kind of either on the very bottom of the car seat or in the back of the car seat. It'll have um, an indented um, expiration date there. So uh, make sure you're paying attention to that. I actually just gave my infant car seat away um, because I know that I'm not gonna have another child before that expires and I want it to get used. So um, I actually gave it to a friend um, who was just having a baby to make sure and made sure that they knew when the expiration date was. Um, also, if you're in a car crash uh, and you do have a, a child in a booster or a car seat, even if it's minor, you actually need to dispose of that car seat or booster. Um, they're no longer um, safe if you've been in an accident with them. Um, and you can always talk to your local fire department. They'll actually help do a, an examination of the car seat and as, uh, they'll also examine how you're using the car seat. Make sure that you know that you're using it safely. Um, so 75% of car seats and boosters are used incorrectly. That can either be that's how they are attached to the vehicle is incorrect or how the child is secured within that is incorrect. Um, depending on the time of year is, is uh, when most of the uh, different kinds of incorrect use we see, for instance, in the winter time, uh, children are not supposed to wear the big poofy jackets or really any jackets uh, under those safety belts because it creates so much space between the child and the safety belt. Um, but so just make sure you're using them safely. Um, really, really important and often overlooked. Uh, the instructions on car seats are really great. Um, they'll tell you exactly what you should do. Um, if you've thrown them away, I throw everything away. <laughs> uh, you can always Google it. Um, they do on all of their websites for the manufacturers have all of the um, the use uh, indications on their uh, yeah on their website. Uh, one of the things that I have to talk about uh, again, this is from Zero Fatalities, is we are in the middle of the hundred de uh, deadliest days in Utah. So essentially, from uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day. That is the deadliest days on Utah road on Utah roads. Um, we're in at 41 days today. As of yesterday at about 5 o'clock, uh, we've had 33 fatalities on Utah roads um, in this 100 deadliest days. Um, so, yeah, we're about halfway, almost halfway in. Um, we're doing better. Um, you can see on this uh, chart that I've got here. Uh, it goes uh, last year, so you can see the 528 of 2021 to 96 of 2021. Uh, we had a total of 103 uh, mortalities on the on Utah roads this year. We're at 33, so we are on track to do a little bit better. Um, obviously, we've got a couple holidays coming up, um, and you know, just all the travel. Just keep keep that in mind that this is the time when you have to be extra careful on the road. Um, I'd be remiss to not talk about texting and driving, distracted driving. Uh, it's always an issue. I think, you know, I, I see every single day people texting while they're driving. Um, so one in four car crashes involve distracted driving, uh, not specifically texting only, but that accounts for a large proportion of them. The average time a driver's eyes are away from the road when sending or receiving a text message is 4.6 seconds. To put that into perspective, 
If you're driving at 60 miles per hour, 4.6 seconds would take you the length of a football field. So it's a huge amount of, of roadway that you're not paying attention for. Um, if you text and drive, you're as dangerous as someone who's twice the legal drinking limit. So it's just like being drunk. It's uh, more irresponsible in some cases. So make sure that you're not texting and driving. Don't drink and drive and wear your seatbelt. Those are going to be <laughs> the biggest, most important things that you can take away. Um, and it's things that we've talked about for years and years and years, but we still see people not doing it. Um, I told you that I really like camping, hiking, that kind of stuff. I wanted to give you uh, just a couple of tips to keep yourself uh, safe. We'll talk about ticks later. Don't worry. We're doing tips now, though. Um, so know where you're going. Um, there's lots of websites now. Um, there's stateparks.utah.gov, utah.com, visitutah.com, alltrails.com. There's lots of resources out there to help you understand where you're going, what you might encounter, what the terrain's going to be like, all of those things. Use those resources. Don't, don't try to just go out and wing it. Um, be really familiar with where you're going. Also, check the weather for where you're going. Check them from multiple sources as well. Um, you may, you know, if someone has an iPhone and they're on the Apple weather, if someone's got an Android and they're, you know, on, on Google or AccuWeather, you'll find that there is a variety of uh, different answers for what the weather is going to be like. Um, and so just I would recommend checking it from multiple sources so that you can be sure uh, that you have a good idea of what you're going to expect if you're going hiking or camping. And then plan for temperature for day and night. We're in a desert climate. Uh, it gets much colder at night, uh, much hotter during the day. Sometimes people forget to pack for both of those things, not realizing um, how drastic of a, of a temperature change that can be. And stay hydrated. Uh, plan every way you can to make sure that you have brought enough water with you. Um, that's another big thing that we see is lots of dehydration um, issues, especially, you know, if you're out hiking, get lost, taking longer than you thought, you get hurt. Um, just make sure you have that backup water. Um, make sure someone knows where you are. Uh, one of the best things that you can do, there's, well, there's two things. The first is to tell people exactly where you're going and when you're expected to come home. Um, always make sure that people know that. Uh, the other thing is turn on your tracking device on your phone. You can turn on your Find Me and share your location with somebody. Share it with a family member, someone who's not going to be there with you. Um, so that they can track on your device or via your device right where you are, just in case something happens. Um, you'll have somebody who knows exactly where you are. And then keep a first aid kit with you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about first aid kits and kind of what's important in them. Um, I was actually just talking to one of my colleagues a little bit ago, just talking about kind of some of the things that are included in first aid kits that I have never, ever, ever used ever. And they continue to be in first aid kits. No one ever uses them. Um, so I have been seeing recently some of the, the companies that are uh, developing new first aid kits are a little more mindful of what's actually being used now. So um, talk about some of the important things. I think that's the next slide. Yeah. So um, some of the most important things that are not included in most first aid kits that I encourage you to please, please include, learn how to use them is tourniquets. Um, it's kind of a, a new reality now that, you know, there's there's things that are going to happen within our society that cause us to be unsafe and we all need to know how to respond to those. So uh, one of the best things, one of the best classes you can take is a thing called Stop the Bleed that is uh, sponsored by the American College of Surgeons. Every trauma center teaches it, mine included. Um, there's lots of ways to take it. Call me if you want want the class. We'll talk a little bit about it later, but um, but it talks about safe use of tourniquets and how to stop bleeding. Um, and so I wanted to just, you know, give my own little plug about tourniquet use. Um, I actually did bring a couple here with me just to show kind of how you use them. Um, but there's there's essentially two different kinds of tourniquets I want to talk about. They are the only two that I would recommend. Um, there's hundreds of different brands and all kinds of stuff that you can buy. Um, it's really scary to use off-brand tourniquets because they may not be as, as secure. The last thing that you want is for it to snap. Uh, you know, snap in half, have the fabric fail, the, the hardware fail on it uh, when you really need it. So I don't recommend buying anything off-brand. Um, it costs more money to buy the brand-named ones. 
but they are guaranteed. So um, that's what I'm going to talk about and that's what I'm going to show you. Um, but the first one that I want to show you, let me make sure I'm going to, I brought, I brought my little handy dandy fake leg here so that I can show you how some of these tourniquets are used. Um, but on the bottom left of your screen there, you're going to see that orange tourniquet is called a cap tourniquet. It's a combat tourniquet. Excuse me. It's a combat tourniquet. I've got one here. This has been used because this is one of my trainers. Um, this is not one I would ever use on a real patient because it's been used as a trainer. But um, you can see that they get really, really large. So they can fit most extremities and they're really easy to use though. You're gonna put that over the uh, affected extremity. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of it because take a stop the bleed class and I'll, I'll tell you all of it. But So all that you do is you try to tighten it up around the extremity here. There's Velcro. And you see this little uh, this little turn here. You can turn this whichever way you'd like. But what this is going to do is that's what applies all of the pressure and actually stops the bleeding for you. So the more you turn this, the tighter around the extremity it gets. So when you're done turning, you actually oh, it's hard to do this when I'm trying to get the camera in too. So when you're done, there's these little hooks that it just hooks right in, and now it's secure. That's not going to go anywhere. You can't do anything with this. Um, can't you can't take it off. You just secure it down and that's that's the cat tourniquet. Super, super easy to use, even if you've never seen one before. Generally speaking, you can just come up, look at it, and you can kind of make sense of what you're supposed to do with it. The next one I'm going to show you is called a rat tourniquet. Um, this one is a little more complicated just in the sense of it's just not as intuitive to know exactly what you're supposed to do with it. Um, this is actually from my first aid kit that I keep in my car. Um, I prefer this one. Um, just because it, it is a little bit more compact to store it and travel with it. Um, but it just depends on, on the kind of storage that you have. But so this is called the rat tourniquet. You can see this is very, very different. There's no Velcro, nothing like that. Um, but it comes with this little loop right here. And all that you do, let's see if I can do this showing the camera, is you wrap this right around here. Stick it through the hole that's already made. There's already a hole in here. You're gonna pull it nice and tight, and then you just wrap it around as many times as it needs to be wrapped. And then you'll see on this little clasp right here, let me see if I can angle it right. All that you do is stick it into that little groove right there. And now you've got a tourniquet on that's really, really tight. So um, those are the two kind that I just wanna show you and make sure that you're aware um, that they're available. Um, you can see I took, I took this information right from, for the cat tourniquets, I took it from the Stop the Bleed website. They're $25 a piece. Every once in a while you can get them for a little bit cheaper, but they're gonna run you between 20 and $25. Um, that's just the way that it is. And then the rats tourniquet, they're a little bit cheaper. They can run you between 15 and $20 usually. Um, I got that one from a, a different website called mymedic.com. It's actually a Utah-based company developed and ran by EMTs and paramedics. Um, it, they're great people that run it and I love, love, love their first aid kits that they have. They're really intuitive, have lots of really useful things in them. Um, love that place. So, um, those are the two I want to kind of talk to you about. I keep these, I keep tourniquets and first aid kits in every trailer, car, my house, my office, <laughs> I keep them everywhere. So, um, and again, we'll talk a little more about stop the bleed as we go. So that's my general travel, um, camping safety. Um, ask me any questions that you have on that. The next one I'm gonna go to is water safety, definitely in the middle of boating season, lake season, it's my favorite. Um, but just wanna impart on you a couple of, of things that I've learned here. So for recreational boating specifically, um, every year in the United States, there's about 4,500 accidents and 658 deaths from recreational boating. Most of those are drowning without life jackets and most of those involve alcohol. So don't drink and drive, don't drink and boat. Um, it causes the you know, same, same kind of issues. So 75% of deaths also occurred when the operator has not received boating safety instruction um, versus only 16% of deaths occur when they've had that boating education. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. The top five contributing factors of accidents are operator inattention, so distracted driving usually, operator inexperience, improper lookout, machinery failure, and excessive speed. Those are the, all the contributing factors. Um, so some resources for you. Uh, we talked about that boating education. 
Uh, through stateparks.utah.gov, there is boating education. I believe it's about $35 maybe for the, the course, um, but it's all, it's a certified course that you can take, um, teaches you, you know, about all of the laws, regulations, how to drive, uh, you know, safely, all of those things. It's a great course. Uh, anybody who is, I believe between 13 and 17, who's going to be operating a personal watercraft actually is required to take that um, in order to legally drive that personal watercraft. Um, but yeah, great, great course. Please, if you haven't taken it, I actually just shared this with my whole family. Uh, anybody who's going to be driving boats and stuff, um, because I actually didn't even know that this was available until I until I took it. So um, the next thing uh, similar to seatbelts is wear a life jacket. Um, make sure you're wearing the right one also. Um, I included a diagram here of different kinds of life jackets that you can use. Um, so type one, um, those are a little bit bigger, bulkier, they're for offshore. Type two, those are near shore. Type three are the recreational ones. Those are the ones that you see most of everywhere, you know, in, in all of the department stores and all of that. They're usually type three jackets. Type four are flowable, uh, excuse me, throwable flotation devices. Um, type fours are also, you know, they can be the, the donuts that you're used to seeing that you can throw out the, the lifesavers. Um, they can also just be these little square cushions. Um, they're really great. Uh, type five, those are special use ones. Um, the one on the very bottom right there is actually almost like a fanny pack. Um, so it's really small and discreet. It's one that you can have on your person. And then if you need it, there's just a rip cord and it will inflate it for you um, or a blow tube. Um, then the other one is the same, but it just kind of goes up over your shoulders. So lots of different things there. Um, make sure that you're wearing US Coast Guard approved um, life jackets. Uh, there's a lot now of ones that are not approved. Um, they're a little bit smaller, slimmer. They're supposed to look look cuter uh, in some cases, uh, but really it it's it's not it's not uncool to wear a life jacket. And I think that's something that in the injury prevention world we're all kind of trying to to change change the conversation around that. I don't know if any of you guys have bought life jackets lately, but they're they're good looking now. They're not like they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Uh, you know, they're all neoprene now. They're comfortable. They don't have that big vinyl uh, lining around them that digs into your armpits. They're they're cozy now. So um, it, there's just no reason for us to not be wearing them. So talk a little about when you have to wear a life jacket. I would encourage you anytime you're on an open body of water uh, or any running water um, that's deep to wear a life jacket. But these are the times when you have to wear a life jacket. So children, um, any children under 13 have to at all times wear a life jacket when they're on the water, uh, when they're on the boat or on the shore, um, they have to wear a life jacket. Uh, anytime that you're being towed behind a boat or a watercraft, uh, so skiing, wakeboarding, kneeboarding, um, uh, inner tube or the tubes that you get pulled behind, any of those, you have to be wearing a US Coast Guard approved life jacket. Uh, anytime that you're on a personal watercraft, um, even if you're not driving, you're the passenger, everybody on that personal watercraft has to wear a life jacket. And then anytime that you're floating down a river, um, you have to wear a U.S. Coast Guard approved life jacket. Um, and that is that is true for all rivers in Utah. Um, I'm not sure about all of the rest of the states, but in Utah, you do have to wear the life jacket. Can't just have it with you, it actually has to be on and secured on your body. Um, most people don't know this, but uh, actually by law, paddle boarding, um, any of those kind of things that basically the, the word is if it floats, it's a boat. Um, but paddle boarding, you actually do have to have, if you're 13 or under, or if, excuse me, if you're under 13, you have to have a life jacket on. If you're over that, you have to have one with you. So actually you should always have, you have to have a life jacket with you on that paddle board. Um, so you may have to strap it onto the paddle board um, or just have it on. Um, but by law, you actually do have to have them. So uh, in general, children under 13 on any kind of watercraft or flotation device has to have a life jacket on. Everyone on a watercraft at minimum has to have a well-fitting Coast Guard approved life jacket on the vessel with them. So I have actually had the fish and game um, or the Coast Guard pull us over uh, when or you know stop us in a boat and I've actually had to you know if we have 10 people on the boat with us they'll check to make sure that your boat is approved for 10 people and they'll actually make you pull out 10 life jackets and make everybody put them on and they'll inspect whether or not they actually are too big too small 
Um, I've had it before, yeah, where they where they actually test you on that, um, which is great. They should, um, because that's not going to do you any good if you know if, if you've got a whole bunch of adults on your on your vessel and you only have children's life jackets. That's not going to help. So again, I said if it floats, it's a boat, and you have to have a life jacket with you. So um, one of the biggest things that we have seen in the last few years are you know there's lots of the the flotation you know little inner tubes unicorn floaties, you know, any of those things, people are on those in lakes uh, without life jackets. Um, and they can, you know, if the wind picks up, you're gone. You're gonna float away. Um, they, they can pop, they can get out from under you. There's lots of things that can happen. And we've seen really tragic accidents uh, involving those. So please wear a life jacket with those. Um, those are not Coast Guard approved. They are not safety devices. Um, you're just kind of hoping that they're going to work. So uh, make sure you're wearing life jackets with those. Um, for more information as well, go to the stateparks.utah.gov. They've got really, really great resources on there for you. Um, another big thing to talk about is how to help someone if they're drowning. Um, so there's unfortunately been, again, you know, kind of a rise in, in drowning victims. Um, and a lot of times we've had people try to jump in to save somebody and they end up being drowning victims themselves. So, uh, statistically speaking, actually, if one person is drowning and another person jumps in, one person is still going to drown and die. So, it's the same if two people jump in. If two people jump in to save them, one person, statistically speaking, is still going to drown. So, we encourage you to not jump in to save somebody. Um, the acronym or the, the saying that they use is reach or throw, don't go. So you're going to try to reach the drowning victim somehow, um, pool noodle, if you have a ski, if you have a rope, if you have something, you're going to try to reach them while you are staying safe, or you're going to throw something to them. That could be a life jacket. That could be one of those type four flotation devices that we talked about, the throwable devices. Um, any, you know, anything that'll float, like I said, you'd throw a rope, um, anything like that. The absolute very last thing you should do is jump in and try to save them because the chances of one of you still being a victim of the drowning is so incredibly high. Um, if you have to go try to jump in and save someone, have a flotation device with you. Uh, one practice that I've implemented now uh, going boating this year is because um, I actually just just recently learned this. I was researching um, a couple of things on this. Um, and what I do now is if any of us are just swimming, you know, from the boat or by the boat, I always have an extra large life jacket that I just have right out with us so that if anything were to happen and one of us, you know, if one of the kiddos were having some problems and we had to try to help them, we could really quickly put that life jacket on if we didn't already have it on. Um, and that's something that's really simple and easy and not something that I frankly thought about before. Um, you know, I would have it in the boat, but I wouldn't have it right there accessible to me. So. Um, little, little things that you can do to make sure that you stay safe. But again, you want to try to reach for them, throw something to them to save them. Don't jump in and become another victim. All right. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about here is heat and sun safety. Um, so from 2004 to 2018, there were 10,527 heat related deaths in the United States. 38 deaths a year are from children being left in cars. Um, very, very tragic. Um, in 2019, just in the first few months, there were uh, 3,692 ER visits from heat-related illnesses. Um, and usually this affects older and younger populations. They have a little bit less ability to cope with changes in the temperature, um, especially anybody who has cardiovascular conditions. 90% um, of these deaths occur between May and September, 100 dead, de deadliest days in Utah. It's the hottest time. Um, it's just when the, the, when, when the weather's not working with us in that manner. Um, so there's three types of heat-related illness that we're going to talk about. One of them is dehydration or heat cramps. These are the most common and least dangerous. Um, so it happens quite a bit. I mean, all of us have been dehydrated at some point, right? Um, it just it happens, um, but you, ha you just recognize it and you do something about it. Um, the next level is called heat exhaustion. This is less common, but it is more dangerous. Uh, we'll talk about that a little more in depth here in a moment. And then heat stroke. This is the least common, but it is the most dangerous. This can be lethal. So for dehydration and heat cramps, um, this is occur. This occurs because of fluid and electrolyte loss due to sweating. Um, 
what you'll start to see in these types of people, if they're getting dehydrated or heat cramps, they'll get Charlie horses, they're going to be thirsty, they'll have a normal temperature, normal heart rate, normal blood pressure, their vital signs are, are vastly normal, they're just dehydrated. Um, they're going to start to feel that thirst. That's usually the first sign for your body that's telling you that you're actually dehydrated. Once you feel thirsty, you're already dehydrated. The treatment for this is that you're going to replace the fluids and electrolytes, decrease the exertion, so take a break, get in the shade, rest, um, and then you can return to your work or activity as long as those symptoms will stop after you rehydrate yourself and, and cool yourself down a little bit. So we have to talk about with dehydration, uh, what the hydration recommendations are. So um, it's kind of hard to pin down exactly how much water you should drink. I know that the recommendations kind of change uh, you know, over the last several decades, it, it gets, you know, a little bit more convoluted, but basically I'm going to say there's not a sure fire. This is exactly how much water you should drink. Um, it's not weight based. It's really not even gender based, although this is the, the most that I could find um, the most supported literature. Um, but it's 3.7 liters or 125 ounces is the target for men, generally speaking, and then 2.7 liters or 91 ounces for women. Please don't ask me how they got to that mathematical equation. I don't know. Um, but what the most important thing, though, is, is that you, you want to base it off of your own body. So if you are thirsty, drink water. Um, if you have decreased urine output, if you're just not peeing, or if your pee turns really dark, if it's amber, you know, you, want, you always want your pee to be a light yellow color. The darker it gets, the less uh, fluid you have within your body. So make sure, you know, use that as a gauge as well to make sure you're drinking enough water. And then if you sweat, um, the more that you sweat, the more water you're losing. So if you're sweating, drink more water. Um, and there's a lot of things that can go into that. Um, talking about sports drinks a little bit, they're great because they do have electrolytes and your body does need them. When you're sweating, you're not just losing water, you're losing electrolytes. So it is great to replace them. However, these sports drinks have a lot of sugar um, and that can be a little bit counterproductive, can upset your stomach and, you know, sugar, drinking sugar is not great for you. Um, what is a good thing to do, you know, to, to replace those electrolytes is if you are excessively sweating and you're trying to replace, mix half, you know, Gatorade or Powerade or any of those sports drinks with water so that you're still getting those electrolytes, but you're not getting the same dose of sugar. Um, and don't do that every single time, but you know, as you need to replace the electrolytes, um, that's a that's a good alternative. Um, and then other beverages, caffeine. So some studies have shown that up to 400 milligrams of caffeine per day is part of an, a healthy diet. Um, obviously, that doesn't take into consideration, you know, any added sugars or you know any of those kinds of things. But caffeine is uh, called a diuretic, so it does increase your urine output and actually can make you a little bit more dehydrated. So sometimes when you are drinking a lot of caffeine, you can still pee and it will look really light yellow. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't look like you're dehydrated, um, but that's actually kind of part of the caffeine. So you have to take that into consideration that if you're drinking a lot of caffeine and your pee is still light yellow, it doesn't necessarily mean you're hydrated still. So um, there's a couple of different recommendations there. Um, some people have recommended that if you drink caffeine, whatever ounces of caffeine, a caffeinated beverage you drink, you should drink double that in water. Um, there's not a ton of science that supports that. Um, like I said, I, I prefer to give you recommendations based on your thirst, what your urine output, uh, your urine, you know, the volume of urine output, as well as your color um, and appearance of urine, and then how much you're sweating. Um, I prefer that you, you know, kind of base your own recommendations on that. And of course, if you have a physician telling you, you know, how much you should drink, listen to them. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll talk about heat exhaustion. Remember, we had we had our um, dehydration or heat cramps. Now we have heat exhaustion. So these people um, are going to have cool, pale, moist skin with heavy sweating. They can have nausea, vomiting, dizziness. Um, their temperature is going to be normal, so their core temperature is not going to be raised. Their body is still doing enough to compensate for the external heat, their internal temperature is not getting too high yet. Um, they're gonna have a normal to high heart rate, might be, you know, their heart rate might race just a little bit, not too high. Their blood pressure is gonna be normal to mildly low. Their blood pressure is getting low because they are losing, losing that water, they're getting dehydrated, their body's doing everything it can to keep the vital organs 
uh, operating normal. So it may shunt some blood into, you know, into your core um, and make your blood pressure get just a little bit low. Treatment for this is going to be just removed from the heat, replace any of the fluids lost, stop the exertion. You cannot return to work or activity um, up until, you know, all of your vital signs have to return to normal. You have to be essentially feeling back to tip top shape. Otherwise, excuse me, you need to just rest, um, rest and replace those fluids. Um, if your symptoms don't improve after doing those things, that's when you need to seek medical help. Um, you know, you can call 911, go to an urgent care, go to an ER, um, anything, but um, make sure that those symptoms are resolving and if they don't get some help. The next one we're going to talk about is heat, heat stroke. This one is a medical emergency. This is the time in which you do call 911. Um, these people are going to have hot, red, and dry skin. So that's a huge difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke is that heat exhaustion, you're still sweating. Your body is still doing things to try to cool itself down. In heat stroke, your body's done trying. It's done everything it can to be better and it's not. So now your skin is dry. You're not sweating anymore or you have nothing left to sweat, right? Um, you're going to have neurologic symptoms. So confusion, slurred speech, irritability, um, sounds a lot like a regular stroke, right? That you can have that confusion and slurred speech. That's a lot why they call it heat stroke. Uh, blood pressure. It's going to be high or low depending on your hydration level. Even if you're hydrated, you can still have heat stroke just based on how hot the internal uh, temperature of your body gets. And you're going to have organ damage. Uh, remember how I was talking about with heat exhaustion that your, your body's trying to shunt blood to the right places to keep all of your organs functioning normal? Your body can't do that anymore. So now you're going to start having organ damage because of that lack of blood flow, the um, increased temperature within your body can actually disrupt some of the, the clotting factors and, and all kinds of stuff that can cause uh, just different body system injuries. So the treatment for this is going to be rapid cooling, rehydration, and you're going to have to be hospitalized. These are the people that we have to really, really watch all of their electrolytes, have to watch um, how well their, their blood rebounds, their clotting factors rebound, all of those things. Um, this is absolutely a medical emergency that requires hospitalization. These are the people that you may see if, if you know that they're in heat stroke, you can put ice packs over their head, on their neck, in their armpits, in their groin, anywhere that's, that will help get that core body temperature down. Um, and that's usually the easiest way to do it. Within the hospital, we have cool machines that you can actually put things on them that will, that will cool them down um, at a really controlled um, and systemic rate. Oh, there's a picture of the... Uh, cooling mechanisms. So again, you can see that there's there's a difference between that heat exhaustion and heat stroke. The biggest thing that you're going to see though is the in heat exhaustion they're sweating, in heat stroke they're not sweating anymore. Um, they may both still have nausea, vomiting. Um, there, you know, this is kind of when your body just goes into uh, uh, survival mode. Sorry, we just are getting trauma pages coming across. I'm trying to make sure that I'm still presenting. Um, all right, so uh, the next thing that we want to talk about is sunburns. Oh, I didn't know that these were going to come up in different different times. Okay, sunburns. Um, we've all experienced them. Uh, I think hopefully by now we all know how to uh, prevent sunburns, but it still happens. Um, and during these summer months, it gets worse and worse. Um, so a couple things we're going to talk about. So for sunscreen, um, it's UV rays that cause skin damage, sunburns, and skin cancer. So UVA and UVB. Um, the SPF that's on your sunscreen, that indicates the level of UVB blockage. And UVB is the bad rays that we're trying to, to you know, not cause skin cancer and all of the things. So when it's SPF of 15, it blocks 93% of these UVB rays. SPF 30 blocks 97%, and SPF 50 blocks 98%. Um, ingredients that you want to look for, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, those are going to be your actual physical barriers um, that stay on top of your skin. Your skin doesn't absorb those right, very well, and so it just pre it prevents those rays from getting in. They're really awesome. Um, the other ones, um, avobenzone, acamsule, and oxybenzone, those are ones that are more chemical, they do absorb into your skin at some point, but they are still a great alternative. Um, keywords to look for, you're going to look for broad spectrum. That means that it's blocking UVA and UVB rays. 
um, water resistant. Um, there's actually no such thing as waterproof or sweatproof sunscreen. It is going to come off. Um, but water resistant just means that it's going to try to hold on to your skin for longer, um, but it, they all still will come off in the water. Um, it's kind of a, a myth that they stay on. Um, so the recommendation is to use a sunscreen with SPF 30 to 50, um, truly even 15% or, you know, SPF of 15, if that's what you have, um, that's great. You know, still blocking 93% of those rays. Truly the biggest, most important thing you can do is reapply the sunscreen. Um, this says every two to three hours is the recommendation. I usually say every 90 minutes to two hours, reapply your sunscreen. Once you get out of water, reapply your sunscreen. Um, that's truly the biggest key. Um, I, I usually opt for just SPF of 30 because just the extra chemicals that go into SPF 50 for 1% more, um, I would rather just do 30. But truly, like the biggest thing you can do is reapply the sunscreen. It doesn't really matter. Um, as long as you're above that SPF of 15, um, how, you know, how strong the SPF is, just reapply. That's, that's the key there. And then obviously try to shade and cover, um, you know, where if you're out swimming, use the rash guards that actually cover your skin, wear big hats, covers the back of your neck and your forehead, your face, um, all of those. So we can talk a little bit about skin cancer. Um, can't talk about sunburns without talking about skin cancer. So there's three different kinds we're going to talk about. First one is basal cell carcinoma. Um, this is where you're going to get a red pearly papule that persists, it can bleed, it can hurt a little bit. Um, that's on that left hand side there. You can see that it's a little bit more shiny, um, deeper red than the rest of the skin. Then we have squamous cell carcinoma. These are going to be more crusty, plaque. Um, this develops or it can recur. It can go away, come back, go away, come back. Um, but that's kind of what, what you're looking for there. So lots of cases, there's 5.4 million cases per year. One in five people are going to develop non-melanoma skin cancer at some point. Um, this is caused by repeated sun exposure. The treatment for these are freeze, scrape, burn, biopsy. There's some topical treatments um, that your dermatologist um, will recommend for you. Uh, the next one is the most serious kind. This is called melanoma. Um, I'm sure or hopefully you have all seen the ABCDEs of melanoma before. Um, this is where you're looking for asymmetry border irregularity, color that's not uniform, a diameter of greater than six millimeters. And for reference, that's about the size of a like number two pencil eraser. Um, that's about that diameter, maybe just a little teeny bit bigger than that. Um, and then just evolving shape, color, size. Um, you can see that picture of different kinds of melanoma there. Um, there's 90,000 cases of those per year. That accounts for uh, one death per hour. Um, this can be genetic, but also due to bad sunburns, um, actually earlier in life, uh, they, they link a lot of melanoma to like one really, really bad sunburn early in life. So make sure your kiddos are really, really well protected, um, you know, through teenage years, early adulthood, all of that. Make sure, um, I think that's kind of when we're all the dumbest and we don't protect ourselves as much, but really that, that cumulative damage will catch up at some point. So please stay protected. Um, and the treatment for these is biopsy. Just try to determine, you know, what the extent is and then, and then follow recommendations by your doctor. All right, I'm going to move, move on from that now and we're going to go to animal and bug safety. So, uh, got to talk about black bears. Utah is black bear country. So, um, I debated on if I should put this up with hiking and camping, but, but I went with animal safety. So, uh, all right, so uh, black bears, for these, uh, to, to avoid encounters with black bears, you want to store food, drinks, and scented, scented items securely, not in your tent where you sleep. Even if they're stored securely, don't put them in your tent. Put them in your car. Um, dispose of trash in bear-proof dumpsters. If you've never seen them before, they're just, they're really, um, really heavy duty. They're hard to open. Um, you want to pitch tents away from trails. So when you see trails, if you're hunting, hiking, camping, those trails are often used by game as well, uh, which also can mean bears. So that can just be their normal pathway that they're walking every day. And if you throw a tent right there, that's going to increase your encounter, your chance of an encounter, um, and also just kind of throw them off. So pitch, pitch those tents off of trails so that you're not disturbing um, their normal routines. Um, bears are more active during dawn and dusk, so be extra cautious during those times. 
Um, when you're traveling, make noise and travel in groups. Bears usually, if you can hear them coming, they're going to just go away. They're, they, they're not going to, you know, stumble upon you by accident if you're making noise. Um, if you do encounter a black bear, you want to stand your ground and you want to look them in the eye, yell at them, make, make yourself known. Um, make sure that you're not going to surprise them and look them in the eye so that they know that you're a human. Um, you don't want to surprise them. Don't back up. Don't lie down. Don't play dead. Not with black bears. So if you would encounter a bear in Utah, don't play dead. That's not what you want to do with these kinds of bears. Don't climb or run. They absolutely can do both of those better than you. Um, I know I have been told in the past that, you know, if it's an adult bear, then climb a tree. They can't climb trees. Yes, they can. So don't climb a tree. Don't run away. They run faster than you. They run faster uphill. They run faster downhill. Don't do it. Um, give them a chance to leave also. Don't always assume that the bear is being aggressive. Black bears can even stand up on their hind legs. They can grunt. They can moan. They can make noises. Doesn't always mean they're being aggressive. So as long as you are comfortable with it and you don't feel immediately in danger, give them the chance to leave. They might just be seeing exactly what you are before they leave. If they, the bear attacks, um, use bear spray. Do not use regular human mace or you know, the, the human pepper spray is not strong enough, so I'm going to do anything. So make sure you have bear spray with you. It's expensive. Um, it's, you know, usually about $30. I haven't found it any cheaper really anywhere, but um, it's a little expensive, but so worth it if you're going to be out. Um, so have bear spray, know how to use it. Um, if you do have a firearm and it is resorted to that, make sure that you shoot to kill. Don't fire any warning shots that can make them more aggressive if you fire that warning shot. And always fight back if you're actually being attacked, always fight back. Um, go specifically for their face. That's their most vulnerable part. Um, the rest of their body, they can you know, kind of absorb any of the pain, but their face, um, eyes, that kind of stuff, um, their nose, uh, make sure that you get them there. And then make sure you report it. Always, always report any amount, any kind of an aggressive animal um, in an area that you're in. Um, it might not always mean that the and law enforcement's going to do anything about it, but they have to be able to track that and monitor the situation. So always make sure you report it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the differences too between black bears and brown bears. Um, so black bears actually can be any color. So don't don't be fooled. You know, if you see, they can even be white. So uh, black bears, it's it's kind of a foolish name to call them, but that is what it is. So um, black bears tend to have more pointed ears. They have smaller snouts that um, or shorter snouts that are a little bit fatter. Um, you'll notice that brown bears or grizzly bears, they've got the big, huge hump on the back of their neck. They've got really rounded, short ears um, and really blocky, big heads. Um, brown bears are actually brown bears and grizzly bears are like the same thing they're just from different parts of the world essentially or different climates so but they are the same essentially um and those do tend to be brown they can be a different shade of brown but those are generally brown so uh we're going to talk about black bears first so again we already said this don't play dead you're going to escape or fight back so utah equals black bears equals don't play dead <laughs> you're going to fight back stand your ground um, brown or grizzly bears, these are the ones in which you are going to play dead. So when you have to play dead, you're going to lay flat on your stomach, clasp your hands behind your neck. This protects your neck and you're going to spread your legs, spread them out so that you're hard to turn over. Um, they'll kind of get frustrated, hopefully, and just leave. Um, but if you spread your legs so that you're, they're not able to roll you, um, that helps, um, stay still. If they don't stop and it's truly they are attacking you, then you fight back. You don't lay, you don't play dead until you are dead. Um, you play dead until you know that they're going to be aggressive and then you fight back. So um, we'll back up just a little bit and do all encounters for bears. So make, make yourself known. This is true for any kind of bear. Um, always make yourself known. Um, you're gonna stay calm. Um, you can look them in the eyes. Um, make sure that they know that you're human and what you are. Pick up any small children that are with you. Um, we are talking about this, but hiking groups, um, if you are, have a bear encounter, you want to look big. So this can be standing up on a rock. It can even be if you've got a blanket or a jacket, kind of fanning it out above you. Just anything that's going to make you look bigger than you are. Um, don't give it food or drop your pack. I know it sounds kind of dumb to say that, but don't give it food. All that you're going to do is make follow you. Um, if the bear is still, you're going to move slowly and sideways. So don't turn your back to it. Don't back directly up. You're just going to move to the side and you're going to keep your eye contact with it and just move to the side and try to move away. 
Um, and granted, this is just if the bear has stopped and it's just looking at you or not looking at you, but if they've stopped, don't run. Um, if you run, the bear will follow you a lot like puppies, right? If you are playing with the puppy and you all of a sudden run away, just out of sheer curiosity, it's going to chase you. So bears often do the same thing. So don't run. If they do follow you, if you're trying to get away, you want to stop and hold your ground. Don't continue to run away. Um, don't climb trees. I already talked about that. And then leave the area. You're in their area. So leave. Do whatever you can. All right. Now that we've talked about big bad bears, let's talk about little teen bugs. Um, so first thing we're going to talk about is mosquitoes. We all know mosquitoes. They cause that itchy papule. Um, in Utah, currently there is a relatively low risk for West Nile or Zika. Um, but the biggest thing that we want to talk about is just prevention. So use an EPA registered insect repellent, uh, repellent. It will actually say right on the bottle that it's EPA registered. Um, any of those ingredients are proven to, to be effective at, uh, having mosquitoes go away. Um, you want to look for 10 to 30% of DEET or DEET, uh, use that as directed. Um, it's written on the cans, use it exactly how it says. I'm not going to read all of the other ingredients, but all of those other ingredients below are generally um, associated with EPA registered products. So um, that's kind of the, the key words that you want to look for. Um, don't use any products containing the oil of lemon eucalyptus or OLE or PMD on children younger than three years old. Um, and then also do not use any insect repellent on babies that are less than two months old. Um, there's none that, that are tested enough to be safe. For, for those little teeny kiddos. So that's when you wanna you know, make sure they're in their car, their car seats, have covers on it, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, avoid places with stagnant water. That's where mosquitoes tend to aggregate. And then the treatment's just topical, corticosteroids, that kind of stuff. It's really just symptom management. Um, for bees, wasps, and yellow jackets, I have a picture here. Oh, maybe I put, there we go. Okay, so for bees, wasps, and yellow jackets, those bites cause a reactive erythema, so it looks a lot like an infection. It just is very red, and it can kind of spread out and spread. Um, the possibility for allergic reaction, um, you might consider giving an antihistamine. Um, if it's a very small, you know, controlled area that's not causing any systemic issues, you can try maybe Benadryl. Um, the the uh, generic name for that is diphenhydramine. Um, so you can try that. That'll just kind of increase or decrease the amount of, of swelling around the area. Um, but the treatment is you're going to remove the stinger, apply ice. You can use um, topical steroids or NSAIDs. Obviously, if you are allergic, you're going to follow the advice of your doctor. If you have an EpiPen, um, if you ever have to use your EpiPen, you have to also go to the ER. You want to make sure that you're not going to have a recurrent episode of the allergic reaction. So. I really like the wasp versus bees uh, picture on the right hand side there. So wasps have a sleek, shiny exterior while bees are covered in little tiny hairs that makes them look fuzzy and rounded. Um, for bees, you have to be really actively threatening to them in order for them to sting you. You have to be right, at, right in their area. They have to not be able to escape that kind of stuff, then they'll sting you. But wasps, wasps are kind of jerks and they'll just sting you because they're wasps. So <laughs> they'll sting for anything. Um, and then bees are usually found in the flower beds, plants, wasps venture out because they also eat insects. So they're not always just with flowers. Um, and then for stings, they both really can, can be painful and cause the same allergic reactions. Um, wasps can sting multiple times though. So, um, with bees, they can only sting once their stinger usually will stay in your skin and then they, they'll eventually die. Um, but they can only sting once, but wasps can re-sting you. So that's kind of where the, the biggest worry for wasps go is that they can just do the repeated repeated stinging all right ticks i hate this picture it's gross but ticks <laughs> that is what they look like if they go in your skin um so we're going to talk about preventing ticks uh tick bites you want to wear light colored clothing long pants long sleeves tuck in your clothing this is um, especially true if you're going to be hiking through really dense forest um long tall grass um that kind of stuff um, you want to stay out of that tall grass if you can. Beet is a really ineffective deterrent. Um, if you have been in any of those places, you want to check for ticks immediately after. So you want to bathe after being outdoors and then do a full body check with the mirror. You want to look in underarms, in and around your ears, inside your belly button, between your legs, around the waist, in any of the hair. Um, you want to really look everywhere. They can burrow anywhere in your skin. Um, and make sure you examine your gear and your pets. 
um, tick removal if you have to remove them. You're going to use tweezers, grasp it really, really close to the skin, and you're going to pull upward with steady, even pressure. If parts are left behind, like, you know, their head accidentally stays in there, you want to just try to tweeze that out as best you can, um, and then clean the area with rubbing alcohol, iodine scrub, or soap and water. Um, you only have to contact a doctor if you start to feel ill after you have a known tick bite, or if you suspect maybe you've had a tick bite. Um, otherwise, just take, you know, you can take care of it. Um, unless it, you know, if it gets infected or those kind of things, you might call the doctor for that to maybe get some antibiotics. But as far as, you know, having it be an emergency, um, just if you start to generally feel ill. So here's just other random animal safety tips to finish everything up. Um, but some tips for rattlesnakes. I know there's always, uh, you know, any kind of venomous snake bites. There's been, you know, kind of wives tales and recommendations have changed over the years. Um, if you get bit by a rattlesnake, do not use a tourniquet. Do not try to suck out the venom. Don't use any cold compresses. Truly, the only thing that you can do is try to stay calm. Try to keep your heart rate down. The lower that your heart rate is, the less that that venom is going to spread throughout your body. So try to stay calm and seek medical attention so you can get that anti-venom. Um, that's truly the only thing you can really do that's going to decrease the, the issues that you see there. Um, I know spiders are really creepy and scary. By the way, I hate snakes. I uh, really, this made me physically ill to even get this picture up. I hate them so much. So um, I took one for the team though. Um, <laughs> spiders, um, I know everyone is always really freaked out about spiders, but really the only spider of medical concern that is found largely in Utah is black widows. Um, there's really even tarantulas or any of those things are generally not a medical concern. They're just icky. Uh, talking about other animal stuff, um, these are just random dumb facts that pop up in my my head and then I research and find out more. But um, I'm always really afraid of badgers. Ever since I was a kid, I was always scared a badger was going to attack me. Um, but they really only attack when they're highly provoked. They look mean, they are, they can be mean, but they have to be really highly provoked before they will attack. So steer clear of them. Um, bats, um, if you uh, are ever bitten or scratched by a bat, make sure you get medical attention so you don't get rabies. Um, capture the bat if you can, but I, wouldn't worry a whole bunch about it um, in an emergent situation, but try to capture the bats so they can test it. Um, cougars and mountain lions, another one of my big fears, um, but you are going to do exactly the same thing you would do with the black bear, act the exact same way. Um, so see previous slides for that. Um, moose are the largest member of the deer family. Um, they're gigantic. Um, bull moose can stand six feet tall at their shoulders. So they're gigantic animals. Um, if you encounter a moose, uh, make sure that uh, you make yourself known and then back up in the direction you came. Um, cows with calves, so so female uh, moose with calves, they're really aggressive. Um, they can be really scary. Um, again, you want to just try to exit the area. Don't run, but try to just back up um, from where you came. Get out of their area. Um, let's see. Random stuff. So if you see one deer on the road, there's likely to be more. So don't think that you're in the clear just because you've you've. Uh, you know, one deer has crossed the road, there's probably more behind you. Uh, porcupines, if you uh, have, you or an animal or anything gets quilled with porcupines, you want to take the quill, remove them right at the base, right up next to your skin with pliers or hemostats, or even just with your fingers if you need to. You want to twist very slightly and pull straight out from where it came in. So if it came in at an angle, you want to try to pull up at that angle. If it came, you know, straight, oh, let's see if I can angle straight, you want to pull straight out. Um, this hurts. Any which way you look at it, um, if a pet has gotten quilled by a badger and you have the ability, take them to a vet to help get them out because it's really, really a painful process, especially if it's in their face. So take them to a vet and, and have them help with pain management and all of that. Uh, skunks. Um, I didn't know most of this, but if you're sprayed by a skunk, wash your skin with carbolic soap. It's just a red soap. Did I include a picture? I may not have. Oh, I did not. Uh, or with a mixture of hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, and dish soap. And then wash all your clothes with vinegar to get the yucky smell out. Um, and then I wanted to just give you some resources, just stuff that I use all the time. But um, zerofatalities.com, wildawareutah, the stateparks.utah.gov that we've already talked about, um, all trails, wildlife.utah.gov, CDC is always a great option, and then utah.com. A um, couple other things you can do. I mentioned Stop the Bleed. 
There are trainings that you can do um, small or large groups. This is a free training. Please contact me if you're interested. I can help get it arranged for you. Even if it's not my team teaching it, I can help get you connected. Um, stepping on, um, this is my own little plug, but this is a geriatric fall prevention program. Super fun. Me and my whole team is actually learning how to, to teach this within our facility, but they're uh, within the Utah Department of Health. They teach this at several different places. Great, great thing. Um, the University of Utah IMC and our hospital actually also does a podcast called um, Adventures in Injury Prevention, Safely Exploring Utah's Great Outdoors. Um, it's a really fun um, podcast. We've been doing it for a couple of years now, and it just talks about different activities that you can do through Utah and how to stay safe uh, while you're doing that. Some of my recommendations I stole from a podcast. So um, I think that's on Apple and Spotify, maybe. I think it's on Spotify. Um, I know it's on Apple Podcasts, though. But I think that's all I've got for you. Um, have my little last parting things, helmets, seatbelts, life jackets, first aid kits. If I can impart anything, that's what I'm going to impart. <laughs> Great, thank you, Carly. Um, we do have a couple questions, but we don't have a whole lot of time for questions. Okay. So really quickly, where is the best place to find out how to get a car seat checked in Utah? Um, at the your local fire department. If you call the fire department, they will help uh, guide you to where you want to go. But usually, you can bring them into any fire department, and they'll take a look. Okay, great. And then the other question that we had was, uh, you said if you're out hiking, you should let someone know when you expect to be back. If you are the one who is waiting for a hiker to come back and they don't come back on time, how long should you wait before calling for help? Because sometimes um, they're just late coming back. It took longer yeah. than they thought. Yeah, totally. I mean, try to contact anybody in their group or that person um, and kind of kind of use a little bit of your spidey sense that um, if they're a person that's always punctual, this is incredibly out of their character. Um, I You don't really have to wait to call the authorities necessarily. Usually they won't start looking until about six hours of them being missing, depending on, you know, kind of the characteristics of the person. If you know right where they are, even if you drive to where they would have parked their vehicle um, and just, you know, see if their vehicle is still there, that kind of stuff. Um, there's not really a hard and fast on when to call. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. We appreciate your time, Carly, and I've seen some comments in the chat. I don't know if you can see them, but there's a few comments there thanking you for the information and your time sharing it. So, Oh, awesome. Really My it. pleasure. Thank you all so much. Can you briefly put your contact information back up on the screen so I that can. yeah, if you're all just interested in the Stop the Bleed class or the yes. uh, class, they have that information? Yep. I'll get there at some point. There we go. So my office number is 801-268-7719. Um, I'll actually, I'll open the chat up here. I think I can open it and I'll put my email address in here as well. So if anyone wants to email me, happy to, I would say it out loud, but my email is super, super long, so. <laughs> okay, I put, oh, I just did that to Megan. Sorry, Megan, can you share that for me in the whole chat? Yeah, sorry, I will share that and then I will also send it to um, our contacts as well so that they can share it with everyone. That sounds great. All right, there we go. Um, Megan, why don't you go ahead and stop the recording? We'll leave the, the meeting open for another two or three minutes just so people can write down your.